Well, thank you, Rosemary and, and Eric, for for contributing to this. Um, I, you know, we often had discussions about similarities um, that we see when we, um, you know, just see talks from different regions and um, even even other regions that aren't we didn't cover today. And um, we've been talking about, you know, hopefully maybe someday having maybe a U.S. Oak Fire Conference. We have an Eastern Fire Conference every two or three years. Um, I I didn't present today, but a lot of work I do also in, um, in, in the Great Plains, which I think shares a lot of similarities with some of the Oregon White Oak and um, California um, Black Oak, as well as the Eastern Oak. And so I think there's even more regions to be included in, in some type of effort, like unifying themes. But um, you know, for it was fairly experimental, I think, in terms of seeing whether or not um, we can produce or have talks and, and identify um, commonalities or even um, even uh, gaps in knowledge that um, you know one person's ecosystem or or studies um, may benefit from from hearing about someone else's ecosystem and study. So um, that's that's kind of what I propose for this fire circle. Um, and I don't know what your perspective on a fire circle is, but uh, one of the first fire circles that I attended was in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and they actually circled around uh, kind of like a virtual fire in the middle of a hotel. And um, they just let it let it go like that. And that's kind of what my vision was for this as well as informal conversation. Um, and if we do need some type of outline to get going, I, I've kind of lined that out here. Um, I guess, you know, the overall purpose would be to try to discuss whether or not there's any hope for unifying themes or identifying shortfalls. Um, perhaps we have some folks uh, first off from the that attended the session who weren't presenters that have any follow up questions um, that that the presenters could address. Uh, I do see maybe two or three folks who have joined in here for fire circle um, or just between between presenters. We can have that discussion if, if we don't have uh, any follow up questions. And then um, I did try to take notes um, from each of your Talk. So let me just give you a peek at um, what I have. Maybe not. I have, um, you know, each person and some and some bulleted points that I took for each talk that maybe um, we could tap if we need to uh, understand some of the finer points, especially maybe those who aren't here today. But I think I captured them here with these six bullets on the right uh, in terms of where I think some of our discussion could go for for major unifying themes, but um, I did not really list any kinds of gaps in knowledge. Um, and maybe that's just something that folks could identify themselves. So with that, um, are there any follow-up questions from folks who attended the session who weren't presenters if you'd like an opportunity to, to ask of them? Um, just to interrupt real quick, Matt, do all of the attendees here have video and microphone permissions? Um, I, I believe so. so okay, uh, great. Should, should. great. But if um, attendees don't and you wish to please speak up. Okay. Um, that's the six or seven second rule for uh, virtual question and answer allowable time. So um, feel free to jump in if you want to at any time. This is informal. How about any inter-presenter questions or comments? I'm sure we could go all day on this. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. I have, I have one that um, I've um, kind of pondered a little bit. I don't have my, my thoughts aren't totally fleshed out, but just in looking at the commonalities and differences across uh, ecosystems from west to east, you know, there's, there's the, 
the concept of uh, misification has been uh, been brought up in terms of you know California oaks as as well or Western oaks, mm. and I feel like it it may apply but in a completely different way, and I don't think it I don't, I don't think it applies that well in, in in a lot of instances and partly because yeah it's just like in the Eastern. Um, oak forests, some of these other species that come in in absence of fire like white fir and um, incense cedar have have a more compact litter bed and so they yeah they they, they change um, fire uh, uh, ability to, for fire to spread but in in our systems because we've kept we keep, tend to keep fire out of these systems the the litter actually for, for even after these encroached in these encroached systems has built up to the point where in the middle of summer, it all burns really vigorously. And so we don't have the same suppression of fire behavior that you have in, a, in an Eastern system where you have periodic rainfall. It's like we, we have the system where we don't get rain for four or five months. And so even these species that have come in in the absence of fire are plenty flammable. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um. That's really interesting, Eric. And it, and so I think in, in like really general sense, there's like universality and the concept of mesification. But like you say, it's, it takes on a, a different a result in that, yeah, it changes the fire regime from historical and um, what's needed to, you know, create and sustain historical communities. But in a different way. Instead of suppressing fire, it turns it into catastrophic holocaust. Well, I'm not, you know, I, I think it, what's actually turns it into the more catastrophic or severe fire is, is the fact that it's not burning frequently enough. So it's, it's fuel buildup. Right. Yeah. So, so take the fire out of the east and you get shade tolerance coming in that lay down all these leaf characteristics and, and decrease the flammability of the system. But in your case, you get the shade tolerant dug fur encroaching and it, and when fire does ignite, it increases the severity intensity of it beyond, you know, historical regimes. Yeah. I think it, mesification, I think might apply better if you took fire suppression out of the equation because then it, it might change the fire regime in, in making fire less likely to spread in these more compact litter beds. And so you, maybe the fire interval would be uh, longer, but because of this interaction with fire suppression and fuel buildup, uh, I think effectively mesification doesn't apply as well uh, in, in, in our env environment, but it's, yeah, it's really complicated with a lot of factors. You're, I think of, you know, from an Eastern perspective, looking West, I think of your climate as having a much drier end to it than, mm -hmm. the east. and so that mesification, you know, is within a different kind of climate conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, I once asked Greg Nowacki, I said, you know, everyone's talking about mesification. Um, you must think, you know, may, does it apply everywhere? And I was like, surely Greg, um, we go to some extents of where mesification really applies. And so, for instance, from the Eastern United States, you go West or you go South into Mexico, where does mesification, the concept fall apart? And um, he didn't really like that there was a geographical kind of gradient being applied to the concept. He, he didn't think it was so, um, so much of a overarching ecosystem process that it was much more of a concept uh, that you use here and there, not something that maybe you can apply spatially. Uh, I guess go ahead, you know, people do try to do that. I guess I would not get too hung up on the literal definition of mesification or mesic or reference to moisture regimes or anything like that. To, to, and so maybe it's not the right word in a larger context. Um, but but the, the concept is that there's a 
because of frequent fire and then fire suppression, there's a change in the system. There's a change in the fuels. And in the East, that change, you know, reduces maybe the likelihood of fire spread and fire, you know, probability. But in the East, that change in fuels accentuates a fire, a change in fire intensity and severity that's not, that's novel. It's not like historic, you know, you know, fire in, in the past that created and maintained these systems. And so the system changes. I, th I think in those general concepts, they're very similar, but they play themselves out, you know, regionally and in, in different in different ways. Uh, so perhaps, you know, the take that name okay. musification out of all, all of that as a label for that, because it's confusing. Hey, I find it, uh, it's a fascinating thing to read about, but yeah, I agree with you, Dan, is just like the, the overarching, the, um, the, the unifying theme is, is that uh, in the absence of fire, there's, there's, a, there's a change and it doesn't favor oaks. Right. Or pines or savannas or, you know, whatever the historical species or systems was or the ones that you desire, you know. Yeah, and the system that, that I presented about, I mean, ponderosa pine is also a, a, a species that, that does well with fire and really benefits from fire. But you see, a, but yeah, it's just, it's, it, so we didn't really have uh, other species coming into that system that were more shade tolerant. It's two light requiring species battling it out. And like you say, they have different growth habits and rates and everything. And then they have different statures and then, and they have different silvics, light requirements. And, and then the oaks get shaded out. There's not enough. I thought that was really interesting to me, what Rosemary said, because like Mike said, I mean, in, to really generalize, I'm thinking in the East, we get so much moisture everywhere that that's kind of not like a limiting factor. And, and, uh, and then I think of the West, well, it's more xeric out there, less rainfall, maybe moisture has got more of an influence on how things proceed. But then she says, and we found light to be, you know, the dominant limiting factor. And that's the same as it is in the East. So, I mean. So I, I should, I didn't mention that, um, and Eric would know this, but the, the area that I was presenting the, the data from, you know, the studies is coastal. So, you know, it is kind of more music than, and we do get higher amounts of rainfall. So, so the questions I had about like the, the, the questions about light versus moisture would be really interesting to, to do it somewhere more drier. It, and that would be great. It would be a great contrast because, you know, our coast here is, if you went and looked back at the slides, pretty wet. How, 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 how many inches of rain a year? Yeah, that might be fascinating for folks. Yeah, Eric. I, well, what is it like 40? Yeah, some of the zones you mentioned, I, I, yeah. I would go kind of like a 40 to 80 inch range. Yeah, it, it's it actually, they're, they're, the oaks are higher, um, you know, and it is high, it is more. Yeah, it's a lot. I should probably have that up, up the top of my head, but um, we do have it that side. But yeah, it's it's pretty wet. And so that's one of the interesting things. But I but I would say, and then I won't keep, that we, we do have sites in Mendocino that are much drier. And we looked for um, at least... Uh, you know, relationships with growth. And uh, we haven't done all of the work that I presented today at all of those 10 sites, but the, um, we didn't really find climate to be a major driver of, of things, but it might just be, it's too homogeneous. Well, I mean, I always view climate as having, you know, broad sideboards on what ecosystems can do. And then when you get down to the site specific or disturbance or management activity and how vegetation responds to that, it, it, it becomes much more in, influential than, than the broad influence of climate. But I, but I think this, 
uh, points to, you know, either like potential collaborations or a synthesis publication of some kind, because a lot of what's written in the East is driven by light being the limiting factor and how you manage light by managing vegetation and structure of the community to, you know, promote your desirable species and to not unleash the undesirable species. But in, like you say, in other systems, it's moisture that's driving, you know, things. Not that other things aren't interwoven with that, but it's, you know, you've got a different environmental variable that's more dominant in vegetation response to disturbances. And uh, just a synthesis of, of that, is especially in the role of management and prescribed fire, um, to get desired conditions and compositions and stuff would would be an interesting discussion. So I just want to say, if you're just joining us, we're treating this as a campfire, and uh, everyone's welcome to participate, especially those who weren't presenters. And uh, we are um, kind of uh, freestyling right now, so anything kind of goes. Mike, I just want to say, any fire I've sat around involves drinking. Um, so I do have, go, go ahead, George. I, um, I do have a mostly flushed out question. Um, and this is coming from a guy who kind of has unique experience with Oaks because I did management and forestry and fire in central Wisconsin, the central sands region, which is gangbusters Oak territory. Um, and then my research project is in the, at the Jones center at Itchaway, which is also gangbusters Oak territory. Um, so I kind of have a unique, we kill oaks because we have so many um, that we need to uh, make sure we're getting like safe fires practicums. Um, so my question kind of for, I guess, Mike and other people is when we did dendrochronology in that area, uh, we kind of in central Wisconsin, we got back like less than five uh, year fire return interval on site um, at the um, Quincy Bluff State Natural Area. It's about 5,000 acres of um sand barrens uh central poor fen but anyway um so and in the jones center you know we have a fire return interval of sub one year in some areas um but we we did we deal with a lot of um of oak regeneration in these areas uh so I, I was wondering mike if there's a combination between frequent low intensity fires and uh strong oak regeneration or if it's more of a product of the sand substrate that these systems um lie on or a combination of both? Yeah, I think it's uh, certainly a combination of both myself. Um, you know, you can have it. I've, I've seen adaphic controls keeping some areas in early succession with very little fire. And then some areas that are, you know, if you don't keep burning, they will quickly become a forest or a very mesic forest but you can keep them, you know, very dry and xeric just through fire. So certainly there's a combination of both. Um, and then the, like from, from my work in the, in Oklahoma, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's one effect of a lot of frequent fire to keeping these, you know, small trees re-sprouting, keeping them regenerating, um, kind of keeping them available as a pool of regeneration to pop up and then and then sometimes those are so short that they actually even allow um, stand replacing fire to occur uh, within those systems but then uh, but then there's those those times when you have you know a little fire free interval that lets them pop up and, and make it into maybe a mid-story or overstory position and and then back comes frequent fire and, and so it's, it's a real kind of complex through time and space. Um, and it really depends on how much variability I think you have through time in fire frequency and in fire severity. Um, another thing that I think we saw in, um, in Oklahoma was that site is very variable in terms of site types. And so just the presence of different types of sites within an area like a moist site and a dry site in close proximity 
close proximity of each other can create a lot of heterogeneity in in oak. Um, and it, it seemed I, I was kind of getting that from Rosemary's talk as well. I think um, that there were some real similarities there between uh, when you see these big cohorts of oak popping up around the 1850s and, and what may be driving that, as well as facilitating maybe the Doug fir to come later. That, that, that demographic data that you showed, Rosemary, was, I can almost show you the exact data with the exact timing for oak and juniper in, in the plains. And um, I kind of another uh, observation I've made in, in, at, in, at least in Wisconsin and certainly in um, uh, Georgia as well is that the oaks actually grow, the regeneration is so dense that even if it's white oak and red oak together and nothing else, it doesn't burn because it's just like insanely dense clusters of oak that shade out and the field moistures are so high that when our typical burning, typical burning windows were not um, burning dry enough to actually ignite a lot of these. So the oak, the surrounding area burns, but these dense thickets, these kind of like ghosts of oak past where we had big trees at one point now thickets, um, we, we don't really see burned. And so they kind of get that, that benefit of another couple of years to grow without fire and they're just competing against themselves. Well, I think it's much more complex than we often uh, represent it in a 15 minute talk. Um, but to, to say, oh, historic fire regimes in the East for low, low intensity, that's, that's not really fully true. And like Mike said, in a given fire um, or fire season, there's heterogeneity imposed upon fire severity because of topography or it's a backfire or a head fire and aspect and all this stuff. And over time at a given site, there's heterogeneity in fire intensity and severity because you know it's a, a drought year or something. So often if you look at the distribution of, of uh, fire severity um, in fire history studies, it's a negative exponential uh, distribution with a lot of fires being low intensity and and uh, and some fires periodically being, you know, high moderate to high intensity every twenty or forty years or whatever kind of the a drought cycle is in that area, and and then equally important are the fire free periods that may run in the, which were, all this stuff was much more variable in the Native American era. When Europeans showed up and were still using fire and populated the landscape, they kind of like fire saturated the landscape. And a lot of these um, characteristics of fire regimes and the role of fire in these systems changes dramatically. But um, with variability being preeminent in understanding you know, how to, create and maintain these systems. And, that, and, and those infrequent but long duration fire um, free periods are when trees grow up from reproduction stage to um, recruit into the overstory and get big enough to, to survive without top kill the next fire. And, and well, so it's yeah, so it's real. It's complex, and it's all these things, and it's not just oh, it was all low intensity. I was Rosemary. You said that the ten sites that you had studied had this kind of similar demographic um, uh, yeah. patterns, and I was wondering if does that storyline underlie why those patterns are the same across your many sites, or what's going on there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, they were very similar. Like if, if I put, you know, I can shed a composite, but if you really like stack the graphs, you know, they're very similar, but the, the, the drivers of change were very similar. Um, and I do think it's a combination of these factors. One thing that we don't know a lot, you know, at most places is that, um, in, you know, we know there was a lack of fire and fire suppression and shifts in fire, but then there were sheep grazing and we don't have a really big handle. We tried to actually in our areas to get some numbers, but where do you get those numbers? So, you know, there's multiple factors contributing to, to the changes. Yeah. 
Would the primary factor for all the oak coming in in 1850 be the suppression or the change, some kind of change in fire regime? I think so, yeah. And we tried to do a fire history study, but we, you know, that we don't have, and I, you know, I have background gender chronology. So of course my eyes are like always looking for fire scars, but the, they, they're just not old enough. Uh, the surrounding confers or you know, the oaks don't have the, the old enough. So. Well, what was that system like uh, before 1850? You think it was a, a grassland? Well, you know, I think there's a lot of debate and we sort of um, like when, uh, when we were, you know, this data came out, we published that paper in 2018, but the, it did contribute to this work, um, contribute to uh, supporting, I'm kind of tangenting, but I'll come back, um, not replanting uh, conifers for forest practices in California, in oak woodlands to, in order to restore. Um, but there was some kind of pushback a little bit about, well, your, your, your oaks all um, only, oaks were only there um, since 1850. Like that was all, it wasn't, they weren't there. The oaks haven't been there. And really, you know, that's not what we believe to be the case. It's more like for, there were frequent fires and the stands would have been more dynamic. And what we see is we see mature stands and no regeneration. We see little seedlings, like was mentioned in other areas, but we don't see saplings because of grazing and so on. So I think, Eric, that there were, you know, again, I, I don't have the data for it, but, you know, there were open grassland areas, like, you know, the Bald Hills and so on, but there were also a lot of more open stands of oak in different age structure. Yeah, it could have been. Have, um, go, go ahead, Eric. I was wondering, but 1850 was the start of the uh, gold rush. And yeah, uh, it, could it have been that the oak stems were used for fuel wood? And, and it's just, you know, they were there before. They were just cut down um, well, by we, the early colonists. It's possible. I mean, the sites that we sampled, again, we were trying to stay away from areas where we could see any um, harvesting, but that is a long time ago. Um, I, you know, I think there was a, a lack of, indigenous burning that really, you know, before there was major European settlement, like, you know, yes, mining at that time, but before the settlement came in, there was already a lack of burning because of extirpation of native people, which we know would have been really prolific in our landscapes in those areas. I was going to ask, do you have any pollen or charcoal studies? I mean, those are often in, instructive in, in longer uh, time frames on the, of the presence of graminoids or quercus or conifers and you know on the landscape we don't in those areas but that's i like that idea uh a lot we don't we have more on coast or then inland in the mountainous areas but no there isn't there haven't been studies in the um oak system so much but good idea i'm noting that you know to, we should do that i have, I have one more comment that i just want to riff off what George was saying of it just kind of fascinates me that in some of the southeastern systems you're using fire to keep the hardwoods at bay and I was talking about using you know fire to keep the conifers at bay and it's just I don't it maybe speaks to uh some adaptations of the conifers in area in our ear area versus ours like just long leaf pine being able to withstand fire at really short intervals uh yeah, there's, there's some fascinating differences there. Well, there's lots of dynamics around that that uh, are, are yet to be understood, you know, um, in, in terms of, you know, how much, what was the advanced reproduction layer like, you know, historically, and how did that change? Now, I mean, we have a debate over, I mean, we have a lot of, when you start, reapplying fire to these systems. Um, and in Missouri, it's kind of an oak centric, you know, e ecosystems. So there, there is a fair amount of oak reproduction in there. But when you start um, applying fire, I mean, and the can, so it prescribed fire is really good at, for managing the understory woodies and, and ground flora and, and, few, and litter uh, seed beds and all that and the, and the mid story. But for larger diameter trees, it's really ineffective and has not much impact on it. But 
um, if you get little local flare-ups that make little pockets and openings, I mean, you have ice damage, wind throw, insects, disease, killing over story, natural mortality, um, you know, that, so you get a more open canopy eventually with this frequent fire and oaks love that, love that environment. And so, and so we just invigorate the understory oak sprouts and, and people debate, well, was this, were they always here at this density or are they more dense now because of history and, and uh, they get frustrated because as managers, because they have this huge landscape goal of restoration, but they can't get away from what they initiate in restoration because the oak sprouts and other hardwoods and shrubs are so prolific and vigorous to respond under a partial canopy and uh, some history of frequent fire that they, they can't leave those areas alone long enough to go start restoration somewhere else. They have to keep burning them to keep the hardwoods back. You know, so, so then, yeah, I'm ending my career on how to kill oaks. And I spent the whole, my whole life how to promote oaks. Um, and, and how to do that with fire, or we're using goats in fire in Missouri, you know, uh, to, to knock the woodies back. Um, in your case, it's, you know, conifers encroaching. Uh, and we're not dealing with like historic conditions. These are like novel conditions and whatever we learn from historic, you know, role of fire, maybe that is more applicable in a maintenance phase, but in the initial restoration phase, it's going to take, you know, multiple civil cultural practices to get it, you know, get it going in the right direction to where fire can be more of a maintenance tool, you know, alone. One thing that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Bryce of Unmuted, were you all hoping to hop in here? I was just um, uh, responding to Eric's comment about uh, longleaf pine. I mean, it is the closest to an herbaceous plant as you can get in a tree. And really going to George, George's point, you know, the only thing, the only reason probably it wasn't in the Great Plains, you know, growing with those grasslands is because of the sand. But, you know, it couldn't outcompete herbaceous plants and, and good soil, but it, it, it does very well in those sandy soils, doesn't it? For sure. Yeah. Um, and kind of a cool thing, too, about the oaks and the pine and the sandy soils that I find is, I think, Mike's point about how a lot of these trees are sapling size, but are probably 50 plus years old and they've just been waiting and waiting. Yeah. For, which is yeah, just the advanced, advanced regeneration hangs around for a long time, doesn't it? It's, it's really impressive. I, I do, when I went to the Jones Center, we did talk a little bit about oaks and it may be a need to maybe keep a little bit more in the landscape because they were probably about 5% of, of trees in the past rather than just total, you know, they're not really invasive the way the other hardwoods are. They, they were a component of, uh, you know, the long leaf pine and they probably provide important resources. You know, whenever you have a, a, a broadleaf uh, tree and with the evergreen trees. They're a little long leaf uh, obsessed. <laughs> You know, it's like the grassland folks, they hate the oaks. And I'm like, well, you know, they they coexist with the grasslands. It's okay, you can have some oaks in there. There, there were historically some oaks in the grasslands and even some pines in the grasslands. <laughs> you know, somebody mentioned something, this, Eric, I think, you know, like right now we're dealing with, in a lot of cases, like timber or hardwood fuel models and, you know, leaf litter and fuels and, and maybe historically, at least where there was savannas and more open woodlands, there was much more of a fine fuel herbaceous graminoid component uh, to the fuel. And so maybe it was like a different, we're dealing with different fuel models today and trying to move the system back to, you know, something that was, was different in terms, especially in terms of fine fuels and fire behavior from that and all, all that kind of stuff. It changes the burn window and everything. Um, I, so I often want, I, I'm always often curious about, about that, you know, that, that the fuel models have changed 
and we're dealing and with then, one, huh? And you know, the main one of the main things that happened was we have all the all the fuel breaks, right? We have all the yeah. fields. We have we have all the non-flammable parts, and that's you know that's what the early account said is as soon as you got roads in and so forth, the fires didn't burn anymore. So I mean, there's nothing the same in terms of fire, you know. Even in the 1960s, you know, if you read the Tall Timbers conference proceedings, they talked about 10,000 acre burn units. I don't think we have anything like that now. Well, you do so. in some places, but not everywhere, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> like in Missouri and so, Arkansas, they have that and probably other places. When, yeah, mm. when people are surprised about, oh, why isn't our fire working very well? That's another component. I mean, there's how is it going to spread? It doesn't have to find fuels. It doesn't. It has yeah. all these fuel breaks. There's, there's nothing the same, right? <laughs> well, and not really. And we're constrained by so many things: the size of our land ownership and what mm -hmm. we what practices we can use. And that even applies to grazers. I'm starting to get more involved in the role of large ungulate grazers in these systems, which was there historically, and often it's not part of our management or research even. To look at those but it's i see you know more and more uh attention being put on on that and but it's different you know uh managing uh bison on 100 acres or a thousand acres or ten thousand acres than a million acres i did have on my notes um some of the grass association uh that you see eric you mentioned you know decline of grass cover uh, as these systems are transitioning away from oak, uh, that's really something you know we see in the east um, with oaks transitioning away. That might be a common theme um, across oak ecosystems. Um, you know, one one thing that's coming up now is like good woodland management is good oak management. You hear that uh, quite a bit in the east. I um, mean, to me, that means in some ways. Grass management is good oak management. Uh, so, are you seeing, or do you know of large losses in grasslands within those oak communities that are transitioning through conifer conifer encroachment? Well, I mean, it's just anecdotal. Um... And just things we see, you know, like those that compare the 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 uh, pictures, but right after fire versus in longer term, you know, right now I, I'm working on some other projects where I'm trying to restore a, a, a more of a group and gap structure silviculturally to forests and 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 bringing in fire too. And what I'm noticing is a lot more grasses are coming in on their own. You know, so but we don't really have good data on what was there historically. Bryce, are you aware of any of that? I mean, that's just what happens, right? The trees come in and they replace the herbaceous communities. So uh, one thing that's interesting in Ponderosa pine um, that hasn't been burned in a while that it doesn't really, I mean, it does come up in Eastern ecosystems too, is you just get so much duff and so forth on the ground that you don't have anything <laughs> on the ground layer, um, which is trouble. And then, you know, that's a difficult thing to burn because I don't know. I think Greg Nowacki was passing around that paper where there's a lot of fine root systems that come in there, and so if you burn that, you can start killing the the big, the large diameter trees coming in. I, I do. I guess I have a little bit of a spin on that we discovered, and that um, in the in the little bit wetter places in the western United States, we did find Douglas fir open woodlands, um, which surprised us a lot. Um, and as Stan says, things are complicated. Um, Douglas fir is a funny tree, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's got some funny characteristics. And it may be that in some of the wetter sites, Douglas fir woodlands occurred, um, not as a, you know, not as a, um, you know, encroaching uh, native species, you know, invasive native species, but simply as a pretty stable um, ecosystem that was in balance with herbaceous Plant. I mean, that was because of fire. Of, go ahead, Eric. And that was that was because of fire, Bryce. You know, we the only balance. way you 
the only way you, if you see um, a system that has become heavily treed, like too many trees, and it used to be herbaceous, you know, it used to be open with herbaceous plants, the only thing I can attribute that to is, you know, lack of fire, <laughs> lack of fire. You lost your understory disturbance. I think that lack of ungulates does a similar thing. Uh, there was a study uh, at Buena Vista National Refuge in Wisconsin where they introduced ungulates and fire back into the system. Um, and they actually reduced most of their woody component because the ungulates were, were using them as scratching posts and then the fire was kind of cleaning them. So they were kind of getting hit a uh, double tap versus one or yeah. the other. So ungulates are your other understory disturbance option, right? We have two, we have fire and we have ungulates. I mean, when humans arrived 10,000, 15,000 years ago, there used to be 40, you know, large mega herbivores that were, were performing the same role as fire. And now we have like two, <laughs> maybe three. So, I mean, the thought is that it used to be, there used to be a really heavy influence from those ungulates, but now we don't, you know, when you just have two or three species compared to 40 or so, that influence has probably decreased dramatically so that the deer, they're trying to help out, but they can't do what they can't, they can't do as much as we would like them to do. And then there are a lot of mixed messages about ungulate uh, contributions. <laughs> You know, there's an anecdotal uh, observation of mine, but it makes me wonder. Um, I deal mostly in timbered, timber fuel models and, and trying to promote oak or pine or restore woodland savannas. And, and if you look at just about any of the fire and eastern hardwood literature, there's like some diameter thresholds that, you know, the kind of prescribed fires we do these days. Um, you know, can or cannot top kill a hardwood stem of a certain diameter, almost regardless of species. And, but then I started going to Southwestern Wisconsin, as George says, which is like, you know, prairie, oak savanna country. And I was seeing some properties that had fire every year for 40 years, and they were oak savannas. And in those savannas were like one inch diameter three quarter inch diameter bur oaks. Now granted, I don't have that much experience with bur oak and like Morgan says, not all oak species are the same, but those annual fires were not top killing routinely one inch diameter trees. Whereas in the systems I'm used to working in, I would say they're all gonna be top killed. And that was an eye opener to me. And it's just started making me think about the difference in grass, grassy fuel models and timber hardwood litter fuel models and just the dynamics of fire duration and temperature effects on, you know, uh, lethal temperatures in plant tissues. And yeah, okay, grass fires are maybe intense and, but they're of very short duration. And some species like bur oak, you know, can withstand those with a minor ball injury and continue recruiting into the overstory. So there, it just opens my eyes to you know, all, all that dynamism of, you know, fuel models and, and then what, and then, you know, what, what practices as modern day managers we use to get what we want. To your and, point. And, yeah. To your point, Dan, behind me is a 700 acre prescribed fire that we did in central Wisconsin in the sand plain. And we, I don't think we killed a single Oak in that. <laughs> yeah. And then there's really interesting uh, dynamics between oaks and conifers, you know, in terms of, you know, we use stem diameter often as a, as a, a, a variable of whether it survives or not a fire. But there, I think there's nuances there between hardwoods and conifers in young seedling sapling stages that, you know, in their ability to withstand, you know, a fire and, and th that can, be a tipping point between you know an oak system a pine system or a mixed system and uh there's a lot of things we we need to learn about that and especially with shortleaf pine in our area that is a conifer that can re-sprout and, and i think um, so, oh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead bryce 
I mean, I think Dan and actually George have gotten to some good points about what, you know, the context of your, your sapling, your little tree really affects how fire affects it. Like if, if it's surrounded by herbaceous material, if it's surrounded by, George was talking about protection from other little trees can help a little bit. And then also if you're in a forest, um, you know, Dan was talking about those, those fires can sometimes also be worse. So it's like, what are the, what are all the different circumstances that could, you know, contribute to um, whether the tree is killed or not really, I could probably, you know, could be very hard to pin down. And I do think those, you know, if, if a tree, apparently if a tree is in a forest, it's, it's spreading more or sending its fine roots more, they're more vulnerable. Um, and so, um, you know, anyway, the context of the fire is, is extremely critical. So we're about halfway through our allotted time here for the uh, fire circle. I want to try to um, narrow us down, focus us a little bit more. And I wonder if we can um, try to get to any types of uh, potentially unifying themes across um, the United States oak ecosystems. And I think one of them that I certainly heard was uh, the first um, point brought up was um, kind of the idea of mesification and how it applies and changes as you transition across the country. I think that's something that uh, we could probably have a really interesting conversation and um, pull out all of our different examples uh, from different regions as to why or why not that that concept fits or how it could be adjusted. I think that's actually a really a neat idea. I wonder if there are other um, other unifying themes that um, particularly with oak and in particularly with the maybe the issues with decline and in, in alteration of oak ecosystems that we're seeing across the country um, if, if there are any other unifying themes that would help us get at that a little more. Has anyone been thinking about anything? Like that? Yeah, I was going to offer that something different than mystification that's unifying. And I really, this hit me from Rosemary's images of encroached, uh, encroaching dug fur on, those, on oaks. And then some of our other conversation here is that so a, a lack of capacity of a system to carry intermediate fire, um, lack of ability for the intermediate disturbance kind of theory to play out. So for in, like those dug fur sites, the only fire that can burn through there is um, a, a high severity fire or high intensity. Um, Similarly, in our oak ecosystems and some of the very, what we might say, messified, uh, fire can't get back in there in an intermediate manner. It often will only get back in there under more extreme circumstances. Is that, is that a fair assessment of some of the sites out there, Rosemary? Um. Yeah, I, I'm interested what Eric has to say too. Uh, it will, and I'm just going to put my brain in the oak woodland uh, systems that I was speaking about today. Um, what we, yes, in the really encroached, I would say, you know, there isn't the grass fuel there, you know, you'd have to really have a fire, um, high, higher fire severity to get it going in those systems. But what I would say is that the oak woodland uh, encroachment is patchy. Um, you know, and it, and it follows a lot of drainages, uh, you know, dug for coming up from lower, more music locations. Um, so you could have intermediate type, you know, patchiness of fire. I imagine in a lot of the areas that I've worked in, it would be fairly patchy because the stand conditions are not uniform. But I think as you go inland, and I'm interested in what Eric has to say, you have an interact, you have both more black oak and white oak, but you know, more black oak. And so in those areas, there is more uniform forest now where there would have been more woodland or open patchiness because of the lack of fire. So Eric, I don't know if you want to address like Klamaths and stuff. 
Well, yeah, I think there's an interaction there with with fire suppression because yeah. um, a lot of these areas don't see that kind of fire. But for example, if you have a fire burning at night through these systems in the middle of summer, you could get the what what you wanted. They just tend to experience the high severity fire because we re we've removed that. Well, I think it's an interesting theme, though, Joe. I think that's a could be something to discuss and. In addition, um, Eric, maybe, you know, with the fires, because we're so close to the coast, we get the inversions. And so it will it will drop the fire behavior down at the lower elevations compared to the upper elevations, which is an interesting and unique situation compared to other regions of the U.S., certainly that I worked in and I know, you know, other locations. So. I think a universal thing is we're all dealing with fire dependent species and systems. And we've pretty much eliminated fire completely from these areas across the country, except for when a wildfire happens. And then it's like, oh, out of control and out of prescription and not giving us what we want, threatening communities, blah, 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 blah. So I think a universal uh, thing is we need prescribed fire and other management on huge landscape scales that we are not managing for right now. And then there's like a host of barriers, social barriers, burn windows, you know, um, agency policies and risk, whatever, blah, blah, blah. There's all these reasons why that managers don't go out and light and do prescribed fire on a big scale. And so I, th I think not all of it is necessarily research, but I think research can, su can support you know, the application and give reason to and dispel the myths and and present solutions to barriers. Like, for example, in the East, it's like fire damage on valuable timber. And so we're looking at these reasons why people that make people hesitant to burn. And we're, and we're trying to understand them, dispel myths, you know, discover the realities and come up with recommendations, you know, to address those real concerns and minimize the adverse impacts, you know, but the bottom line is we need more fire on the landscape as prescribed fire, you know, in conjunction with other management where we can do those things. Um, to, to play off yeah. that, I'm sorry to keep poking at Rosemary and Eric, but what are the what are the major myths in your opinion in the, in the West in terms of oaks and fire? Like, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that people might have? Well, I'll start, but I'm sure Eric has. I mean, I think overgeneralizing about any fire, you know, location of in fire regime, you know, one type of fire is a major myth. Right. I mean, that's probably the biggest myth everywhere. And so I think we can't we can't um, over hammer that point, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. You know, that uh, and I think I brought that up a little bit in my talk is uh, there's an over generalization that because oaks resprout that high severity fire, you just have more high severity fire, you'll have more oaks. It's uh, yeah, it's just it's not as simple. Are there, so do you think that there are major um, questions about fire management for oak regeneration in, in Oregon White Oak and California Black Oak? Oh, yeah. I think there's very little understood about that dynamic. It's, it's really, it's un understudied. And I think that pe people don't really understand, you know, there's always this concern of, of, I think there's there's an assumption that that fire is uh, kind of uniform, spreads over 100% of the ground. There's there's uh, we have not really integrated the patchiness of fire, especially when it occurs on on um, uh, shorter intervals, uh, to enable a species to regenerate. Um, yeah, so I think there's just a lot not understood. That's why I actually. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, at least, um, and I don't, I don't know, um, Black Oak too, but, but Eric could probably speak to it better, but, you know, there's just no regeneration of white oak. Um, and so that is a serious problem, all right, because we have the, these mature stands, I just showed that age structure, that's everywhere. 
And so we have this situation now where we can't get oaks to regenerate because we don't have giant excluded exposures or, you know, or we have a lack of fire on the landscape. So I think that's a major concern. I was going to just say that that's why I encourage you all um, to, to develop the Western Oak Book, you know, like Paul Johnson's Oak Book. He, he tried to make that, you know, for the U.S. And, and, and so he's not a Western expert and he wasn't even like a fire interested person. In, in the more recent editions, we've added fire chapter and Oaks Woodland and Savannah chapter. But, uh, you know, back in the day, it was like this guy, Doug McCleary, who, you know, he was he was doing the only re oak research out there in California. And, and it was all artificial regen, like you say, because there's no oak regeneration there. So he's going out and planting trees and doing little studies like that. And and so I, I think it, it's time to, you know, like Paul Johnson's book does, is not the end all be all of Western oaks. And it, and it would be good to have that to assess what do we know and what are the current issues and and what is the, where are the gaps and what's the research priorities and we can all as a community of oak people rally around that and uh so i know i know it's like in your spare time just whip out another yeah. book but uh well, it's I just, it's, it's, it's been very, you know, probably like most areas, uh, silviculture has been very conifer centric and yeah. our, you know, oaks were kind of trash, trash species cut down and it still drives me nuts when I see, uh, people developing, uh, you know, shaded fuel breaks where they're cutting down the oaks and leaving the conifers because the, the oaks tend not to have the, not to crown out in, in fires. And so it's like, ideally you should have, you should have a, a lot of oaks as part of that system and mix up the, the, the canopies. But I don't think people don't really understand that. Yeah. I do, you know, I do think that there's a really good opportunity. There are a lot of fire and oak regeneration studies in the East that may be able to help at least some ideas. I'm not sure if they were like, you know, really transferable, but I bet some of the ideas and some of the results are transferable to, to some of those situations. Well, yeah. and a good example of that, Mike, is, I mean, just a simple discussion of sources of oak reproduction. There's the acorn, there's seedling and sapling sprouts, there's sprouts from bigger trees, you know, these are the sources, and then what are their competitiveness, you know, and how often do they occur, and, and, and so the conclusion in the east is oak is advanced reproduction, driven and um and i know. think one of the major um unifying themes across the country that i don't hear many people talking about is that many of our oaks regardless of species are getting to these sizes and ages that they don't re-sprout right air suppression has gone on long enough now that these trees are beyond their functional capacity to re-sprout at, a, at a, I think a fairly dangerous level for, for the ecology of oak to be relying on re-sprouting. And now we have mass failure of this portion of its ecology. Um, and I think a critical national problem is right now, most of our oak forest might be, you know, in the East 40 to 80 years old. So they're probably in the prime of their life for acorn production. But if if we don't regenerate them and develop advanced reproduction populations, you know, when they get to be 150 and 200 years old, they're going to, at some point, they're going to stop producing acorns. Now you've lost over the half of the forest in the Eastern U S the ability to naturally regenerate Oak, anything. And now it's all artificial region, which is expensive, you know, and, uh, and less likely to happen because of the cost and, uh, so I don't, I don't think too many people realize we're at a tipping point. If we don't do something now with Oak systems across the country in the next 40 years, the job's going to get a lot harder and more expensive and less likely to happen. I, I don't want to be an Yeah. I don't want to be an alarmist, but. I, I just want to um, kind of build off that though and say, I think oaks are going to do fine with climate change in the West. <laughs> so oaks were not necessarily concerned, you know, with, like we are in, in some systems. So 
Yeah, yeah, I think that that is a positive relationship here too. Um, yeah. We're maybe seeing some of the fire activity that you're seeing as a result of you know warming temperatures yet. Maybe some places in the in the Great Plains, but um, I think we're still maybe waiting for some of those signals to do a climate by itself. I mean, you even said it, Rosemary, that it's important, but it's not having the influence that you've seen as, you know, other factors or finer scale dynamics and stuff. And so we, we can't just, you know, think, oh, climate change is going to like favor the oaks and save everything. It's like, no, it's going to take us. It may be making our job easier. Certainly a lot of oak species, not all, but a lot of them and pines are adapted to expected future climates. So it's not just a re recreate history thing. It's like, no, these species and these systems are resilient to future climates. So um, yeah, I would say, of, to, yeah. you know, in the West here, we're gonna see, we, we guarantee to see, as you know, like more fire out of control. And so that's gonna, you know, the, 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 the connection with fire is coming back strong. Yeah. And if it's catastrophic or more catastrophic and it's killing the bigger oaks, and if what Mike says is true, the bigger oaks are less likely to sprout. And like you say, the other oak reproduction isn't there. Then the, the future climate change and the fire regime that results from that is not going to favor oak. So does anybody have any... Um, we're kind of now down to the last third or less quarter um, of time. Does anybody have anything they'd like to bring up that's kind of a gear switch? Um, I, I guess I would just bring up that, you know, what we see today is not what we saw in the past. So, you know, what we learn about trees now may be not what we would have learned if we studied 200 years ago. Um, and there is this idea of, you know, trees that are not, even if they're fire tolerant, you know, if they're naive, if they've never experienced um, any kind of fire and suddenly they're in a, the midst of a fire that they're, they're way more vulnerable than they would be if, if they had, you know, experienced that out throughout their lifetime. And so again, we get a lot of unexpected outcomes because the conditions are completely different than, than we had 200 years ago. I think that that's kind of sort of what Joe was talking about and that you can't get the low severity fires anymore because you have so much tree fuel now, right? It's, it's always gonna be higher severity and, and people talk about that being necessary to get rid of our in, uh, invasive native trees, but it's also pretty hard on the oaks that have never, even though they have the traits, they've never experienced that low severity fire either. So it's, a, uh, <laughs> there's that um, naive, um, naive, problem. I, I think, and I hate to say this because I never want to say anything against oaks, but <laughs> we, we could be looking at like oak abundance and distribution greater than it's ever been because of early European fire frequency and then boom, you know, stop fire and the oaks rose to dominance, but now things are changing. And, and so I think that just like the Native Americans purposefully managed their landscapes for what they needed, we need to think about um, what, uh, what we want, you know? And, and right now, I think a lot of the things that we want, oak and, and pine and more open systems have a major role to play in, what, in giving us what we want. And, and so because of the last hundred years of land use history, we, we have these more homogeneous landscapes. So whatever attacks them, insects, wildfires, drought, you know, it becomes a catastrophic forest mortality event. And, and, and that ripples through the ecosystems because we don't have the diversity of systems out there, composition, structures, ages. And, and, and there's a role for oak and more open systems and pine systems on the landscape. And it's a challenge for us to figure out how much, what's the right amount, where does it go on the landscape, you know, to, to address resilience, climate change, conservation of native species, you know, wildlife habitat, all these things. And, and too often 
we are di one singularly dimensional. Reduce fuels to reduce fire, or you know, promote oak, and and it's really multifaceted, you know, in terms of these systems and 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 all the goals they contribute toward achieving for us, and then to ramp it up onto a landscape scale in a in a multiple ownership landscape. Um, I think we're doing a poor job of all that right now. You know, I think, you know, the biggest problem is that people think that more trees is better and we think that fewer trees is better. And so that, that makes, that's already a problem. Like just at the starting point, it's a problem. Yeah. I have one quick question for Rosemary and Eric, although I think Eric might have left. Um, yeah, in, in the East, we have, you know, a lot of conversation about over browsing from deer and being a major regeneration limitation. And I'm curious if that is part of your all's conversation or yeah, observations. It is, especially in our white oak systems. I mean, I think it's true in black oak too, but I, it's definitely the issue. Uh, we see a lot of seedlings. I mean, they're, you know, the other reason why they don't make it, but we see a lot, like our numbers, I didn't present it, but like our regeneration numbers or our seedling numbers are pretty high, um, but we don't have any saplings. It's browsing. Um, I just wanted to mention, I was gonna mention deer. In 2019, I, went, I worked for the Natural Heritage Conservation section of our Wisconsin DNR as a biologist. We went to a meeting with the NRCS and they put habitat loss as number one uh, threat to our like white oak, our oak populations and deer browse was number two below lack of disturbance or in you know, lack of disturbance regimes. So I think deer is like a huge problem that most people don't talk about, or it's not as marketed as it should be. And I actually would disagree, but I am a, I, I think herbivores have been a part of the system forever. In fact, they used to be much more influential than they are now, that they have a wide uh, range of, um, things that they will eat and, you know, not just oak, not just oak seedlings they eat. They, according to deer preference charts, that's not the only thing that they eat. And if they were really doing what they were supposed to be doing, then we wouldn't have as many trees. So I, I don't see the influence of um, deer. Like I don't think their uh, influence is very strong. It's uh, localized. <laughs> it's the influence of herbivores is not as it used to be. And, you know, in some cases, um, you know, they're, they're also struggling because they don't have the forbs that they used to have. Well, that's an interesting theme in itself in that there's a lot of disagreement or, but it's anecdotal. <laughs> we don't have a lot of data on it. I know we tried to get exclosures in, but you know, it's expensive and based, we just didn't pull it off. So I think that that's an interesting, you know, point of, Content, like po positive contention, but when that, that there are many different views on without a lot of yeah, data. Yeah, most people consider uh, uh, deer overabundant and a huge management problem. I consider them a natural disturbance that have always been here um, and, and used to be much, you know, there it's like we've had an herbivore suppression um, because we lost, you know, 40 species of herbivores you know, they're extinct. <laughs> um, and so it's like we have an herbivore suppression problem and that they could contribute to removing trees that they do not, you know, obviously if you're in an oak system, then you'll see that they eat oak, but they eat, according to the deer preference charts, they eat a, a huge range of, of trees. I mean, they don't like pine trees, <laughs> but they eat a huge range of uh, anything that's not a pine tree. That's a good discussion. They they will browse white pine. They love young okay. white pine. And okay. I think in a lot of areas that you see deer like over browsing is because they don't have anything else and they, yeah, they don't have for, yeah. they don't have forbs anymore. And I mean, maybe nationally their populations are aren't higher, but per capita, especially in a lot of areas where we have oaks, we see at least in Wisconsin crazy high deer populations compared to what they used to be because of the management strategies that the DNR put in place. And that's where we see a lot of 
struggle with deer browse and uh but in re regeneration of any species i mean they're just insane the amount of, of uh, well, browse that will happen and uh, uh, historically their populations were probably about the same as they are now again there were historically many more also other species but you know when they were when they were in the recovery phase in 1947 i think leopold identified identified places where their densities were really high. So even when they were extirpated from most places, there were localized areas of deer disturbance. And that is a, that's a characteristic of natural disturbance that you have a range of severities, right? From none <laughs> to high severity. And, and, and that's just, that's probably been their pattern. I mean, that's the way herbivory is, that it, it comes in a range of, of intensity and severity. And so, you know, again, I think it's really telling that even when, you know, again, extirpated throughout most of the United States, and yet he found areas where their densities were extremely high. Um, and, and so this is the pattern. And I, I, I don't think it's a problem that in some places there isn't any tree regeneration. This is anecdotal, but I've, I've worked with the Menominee uh, Indians in North Central Wisconsin. They have a reservation of 250,000 acres and they hunt the crap out of deer, you know, and, and they, they, I don't know what, they have like deer densities of 12 to 15 deer per square mile. You step outside the reservation in it on state land or private land and it's like 80 deer per square mile. And so, yeah, deer, deer were around, you know, it's, they're a native species, but, um, you know, I, the, the densities, and you may say, you know, in, in some respects, yeah, it's local and it really depends on, you know, the hunting pressure and deer densities and how those are managed and what else they have to eat. And, and, and that all that factors into the, in, the impact they have on forest regeneration. But I mean, I mean, there's enough areas around where there's deer densities high enough and they're managed in a way that it, they create forest regeneration problems. So like in Pennsylvania, they actually put up freaking 40 and 60 acre deer fences to keep the deer but, out. But Dan, I mean, they're, they're browsing across a wide range of tree species. And again, they're doing their job. They are creating a balance between herbaceous plants and woody species. I mean, that, that's what fire does. They're, doing, they're providing similar understory disturbance that is valuable. I mean, they're doing forest restoration for free. Well, my, so I'm not a deer biologist, but I had this anecdotal experience with rabbits. And, and yeah, they browse and graze on a lot of things, but it's seasonal. So in, in the wintertime, when all the herbaceous stuff is dead and gone, they hammer the woodies if their populations are high and they have an impact if their populations are high. So they might, they might eat a lot of things, but if it's very seasonal and in some seasons the woodies are the main diet, then the woodies can take a hit. And that's a good thing though. That's what we want. <laughs> well, if you want a savanna or woodland, yeah, nail the woodies. <laughs> but if you want exactly. an oak forest, an oak regeneration, then it becomes a problem. So, so management goal, you know, helps determine whether it's a problem or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanna I wanna um, see if there's any last burning questions from any of our guests who have not uh, chimed in. Um, we have a couple of listeners. That's great. Um, continue listening. I just want to like pause for a second. If anyone has a question they would like to ask at the very end. No, I want to speak up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna mute Dan for the rest of the uh, session. Okay. Um, I did want to actually uh, shift one gear, and um, this is something that I think it did come up in our conversation was that there's a lack of information about oak fire regimes. And um, I think that that is actually uh, generally a good point. And um, certainly a lot of fire history work is focused on conifers. Um, you know, for some reasons, many reasons, conifers are easy compared to oak. Um, but that certainly could be a cross-cutting uh, theme that um, maybe some fire regime information from oak systems is 
transferable, if not like absolute numbers, the actual patterns and function that that are kind of uh, imparted on systems through certain types of fire regime changes um, through time. So I think that could be a possible unifying theme that we could look at um, for certain types of oak systems that are maybe um, site and climate and similar. Um, so, but on top of that, uh, one thing that I, I really like to watch the um, uh, indigenous TK studies, talks, information that comes out of kind of your part of the world, Rosemary, um, especially with the crook and in all the different um, historical uses of oak ecosystems, the historical treatments of oak ecosystems. To me, it really enriches um, how I think about oak ecosystems and, and all the other things besides oaks themselves that, um, you know, come from oak ecosystems. And we really lack that, I think, in many cases in, in our eastern uh, forests. A lot of, you know, people were um, physically removed from oak ecosystems and that knowledge has been lost. And um, I think that is certainly one of our large gaps in knowledge uh, in the central United States. Uh, maybe folks in maybe folks in the Appalachian region would would be uh, in disagreement, but probably not too much. Um, but I think that's a really interesting area of inquiry in the eastern United States. You know, there are some I think ideas that some of these oak these really prominent oak, oak ecosystems correspond with really prominent human regions, um, in that there's very good reasons for some of these oak ecosystems to have been cultured and maybe promoted over long time periods, uh, thanks to people. Um, so um, I think that maybe drawing from those oak ecosystems where um, there's continued uh, indigenous use of them would be very valuable to, I think, reimagine the use of the Eastern oak ecosystems. So I'll just kind of cue that up and, and see, what, see where that goes from people's perspectives. Well, I agree with you about fire history. I mean, we've talked about this. There, the, the material we have to document that is slowly decaying, being destroyed, and, it's, and, it's, and we're losing that information. And so to capture it now, as much as we can now, is going to serve generations you know, a thousand years from now when they're, when they're so far distant from, I mean, we're only 10,000 years or 15,000 years from no humans to humans and today. And so I had a question for Rosemary, because you said that like a lot of your forest, your trees were so young, you couldn't go very far back in, in uh, time with fire history, uh, dendrochronology techniques. And, but I just, my question to you is, are there like, old pine snags or stumps yeah. in the in the understory of these things and it doesn't take too many of them to like represent the fire history of that of those sites and actually it might be an oak site but it was an oak pine site you know and those pine yeah. samples you know can take us back to 1600 or 1500 do you yeah. have that um well so in the white oak i'm going to stick with white oak and then i can address if eric's not back a little bit about black oak but um in the coastal areas that we worked in, we specifically stayed away from harvesting because, um, so certainly there are areas that have oaks and conifers, um, but uh, generally it's kind of like these ribbons of conifer dominated, and then it would have been oak dominated, and in the oaks are kind of in like a, a landscape surrounded by conifer dominant systems outside of that, more dominant. Um, so, and I do like my, not to, I do, I do have a dissertation in fire, fire history, fire scars. So I am one that likes, like I said, like, you know, scouts around and we did find certainly in the drainages, you know, lower elevation, we can find some scars, but in the kind of woodland areas we were looking at with, I presented today, we didn't find those kind of 
scars that would go back. Our oldest oaks were like 300 years old, I believe, and that none of the conifers or oaks were older. And we searched for the oldest trees also, in addition to like random sampling. We went around and looked for the, the oldest trees. Okay, but speaking really quickly, as we go inland and in a little drier, um, more mixed conifer oak, hardwood systems, there certainly are the ability, if you can find um, locations that have those old trees that haven't been harvested to identify a further fire history. Yeah. And yeah. And it, you know, there's a fair amount of fire history that's been done in our Northern California area, but it's not everywhere. And one thing that, and sort of speaking, not to take over the, the, the mic here forever, but speaking of Mike's comment and then yours, Dan, um, there, you know, when I moved here, which was a lot while ago, decade ago, um, more than a decade, Frank Lake is someone who would be nice to connect in with that. He's done incredible work and he speaks both worlds and, and can, has just done phenomenal work and among other people. Um, but he and I, a long time ago, and then you get really busy, have talked about trying to do long-term, you know, uh, sediment cores and connect with the treeing record to look at indigenous burning in different places. And that has not done been done very well here. I mean, it's hard, right? But it needs, we need more work on that. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Catherine has her hand up. Oh, good. Yeah, I thought I would wait till there was a lull because I'm going to de derail the conversation a bit. I hope that's okay. But so I was hoping to talk to some of the trait coordination people who spoke, but it looks like we're missing a couple of people. So I have you all here, though. I thought I would ask. My research is on bark traits, and oaks are a really interesting group since they have this really big, broad range of relationships to fire. And bark is such a big indicator of the fire life history strategies. And specifically, I'm interested in the trade off of developing big thick bark and how that limits stem photosynthesis and i was wondering if there's been any work at all on stem photosynthesis in oaks does anybody have any idea okay i thought i would just throw it out there <laughs> yeah i mean i so i think you're a pioneer um, okay. <laughs> i haven't I mean, everyone probably people are quite, you know, people are interested in that trade off. Between, you know, I mentioned Doug for other people have probably mentioned Doug for, but that is a very odd tree and that it is fire sensitive when young, but develops some of the thickest bark you can get and lives for a thousand years, right? So, um, you know, anyway. Yeah, it rep the bark thickness represents a big uh, sink in resources and so that it mm -hmm. has to be justifiable for protection. Mm -hmm. And the uh, inner bark has sort of a trade off to outer bark in investment. Um, and the, the, the real roles of those two layers have only recently been examined in studies. So um, I do, do this in eucalypts, which is even more complicated. <laughs> no yeah, one I mean, the, the trade offs, um, you know, for fire tolerance mean that those trees, you know, they, they put resources to below ground growth rather than to growing fast and starting to regenerate quite quickly, you know, like red maple does. So we, I mean, we see those trade-offs. What's working now is, you know, do not put any resources into fire tolerance. Be, do not be a stress tolerator, be a quick reproducer as fast as you can. Cause you know, you have to get everything done within a hundred years you're gonna be cut. So whatever you can do real quickly works really well. I think there's a lot of interesting dynamics like what you're talking about at the individual tree level. And, and I'm just thinking, you're making me think of like, I've seen papers out of the Mediterranean, you know, Southern Europe, where um, they, they look at frequent fire and the effects it has on bark thickness and bark of surviving trees anyways, bark thickness actually increases be, as a response to frequent fire, even within the same species, you know, for trees that haven't been burned. And and there's a, there's a lot of really interesting, you know, things like that that um, add to the bigger picture of how things work. Um, yeah, yeah. To your point, I think, uh, and also to Bryce's point that the the driver of, of thick bark is really the low severity and moderate severity fires because it improves survival. But if the only fire regimes we have now are are severe level fires, 
bark thickness isn't necessarily going to help with survival, especially if you've got a, um, a strategy of investing in below ground and resprouting basally the thick bark element is not going to improve your chances. Um, so we may, it may be interesting to see a shift in species composition or in individuals developing less of this thick bark, especially in basal thick bark, which we see a lot in the pines. And it may be one reason why, you know, even fire tolerant tree species, if they haven't been exposed to a fire regime over their lifetime, and then suddenly they're hit by a high severity fire, they, you know, they're going to have the same mortality as many other species. They, you know, when it is there, it may help some. Um, and, and if it's not there, you know, if it hasn't been developed over time, then, then there's, then they're essentially not a fire tolerant species. Okay, well, we are in the last three minutes or so here of this of the uh, fire circle. Um, so, well, uh, thank you to everyone for all your contributions in the discussion. It's been really great. Been wanting to have this kind of cross continental oak conversation for quite a while. So, um, may it be the first of many into the future. And um, I will uh, for sure with the um, Presenters in the session, I'll, I'll share my notes um, that I've taken during your presentations as well as uh, during um, during this fire circle, and hopefully we can kind of uh, outline that into something that we may or may not uh, push forward as uh, some kind of paper of, of some type of style. I'll leave it open now for any types of parting thoughts for anyone, um, but uh, certainly want to uh, emphasize the thank you to everyone who has contributed and in, in participated. Mike, I just wanted to add in when you brought up the, you know, management of oaks by Native Americans, I think hickories are probably the best indicator of that because they're a little bit anomalous. They're not really super, <laughs> they're not like oaks, they're not really fire tolerant, but they do provide good resources. And I think when we talk about oak hickories, we're really talking about oaks, um, supported by fire and, and indigenous people, and hickories really supported mostly by, by Native Americans relative to fire. That's my thought. We're going to have to unpack that later. <laughs> I like it. Any I other? Just, I just wanted to thank you. I really enjoyed the session, and I really enjoyed this conversation, and, it, and I do hope that we can have this conversation again and I'm interested in pulling together something but also it also was thought provoking mm -hmm. and like Dan just said I think we need a billion dollars but you know yeah. I got a lot of ideas out of this discussion so I really appreciate it yeah hey Rosemary I just want to say even though we're in the east like we'll go anywhere do anything you know yeah okay like, great <laughs> you know, team, so, team together yes yeah so I mean if there's like some we have a lot of common ground, I think, and and so please reach out to us, and we'll do the same to, you know, further some of these ideas. That sounds and, great. I'm and excited. and Rose, how do you pronounce your name? I feel like they're they're actually talking. Of, they know a Rosemarie, and so that's uh, why they're saying Rosemarie. But I'm wondering. Right. If you're yeah, well, both my both my first and last name are like you know easy to <laughs> Rosemary is the Rosemary. Way I, yes, Sorry. Way. <laughs> no, it's, I'm not offended. I'm not easily offended. Yeah. Well, they, they all work with a Rosemary, and so that's uh, yeah. why you're hearing Rosemary. Yeah. <laughs> well, most people who know me say, hey, dumb shit. <laughs> I was Dan also is actually, Dan is just modest and likes to tell jokes. So we, we all respect him highly, I know. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Anyone else have par any parting thoughts? We're down to a minute here. I think we're out of time, actually. Well, I was just going to point out that we're not quite as hurried as we might be indicating that the session technically goes till um, 2.40. We have 10 more minutes if, oh. if we wanted to stick to the printed schedule. Okay. And and frankly, they I don't think they would like, I mean, I don't know, maybe they cut it off, but I think it probably just keeps running until the set and time, some sort of time limit maybe, but... <laughs> Well, Mike, I mean, why don't you spend the last bit, you know, share, I mean, you had an original vision of getting us all together and, 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 but then eventually like maybe 
publishing some of this, you know, to, to tease out some of the universal things and regional differences. And, you know, I mean, how do you feel now that, I mean, this was your session. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I think it was as much to try to um, bring something new together as it was to learn. And I wasn't sure if I was just going to learn a lot and nothing would be able to be come together. And uh, certainly I have learned a lot, um, but I do think that there is some potential for developing, you know, what we were hoping was, you know, maybe unifying themes that really do cross such large expanse and that could either um, aid others in in their questions that they have or build collaborations that they need or um, or just change you know the way you're thinking or approaching certain types of questions and um, I, I I have gained all of those I think that uh, there are things that uh, information that um, I would like to learn from the West that I don't think we're going to get it from the East. And, and I, I personally think that there's information in the East that could really help in the West. And, and I think there are these large unifying themes like, you know, I'll just go back to mesification that would be really fun to explore in terms of whether or not it works um, across such a large gradient and it will be super uh, informative uh, to that concept in itself. And so, um, I feel pretty good about, about what was presented. I was really hoping that folks would um, provide synthetic talks uh, that people could you know, relate to uh, at a large scale and, and more or less, I think we got that. We didn't really get into you know, some of Morgan's fire trait information or um, some of uh, Heather Alexander's feedback information, but there's likely more fodder there um, that we didn't explore uh, that would relate outside of those regions. Um, I think the next the next step is to probably put some of these ideas down, flesh them out a little bit in terms of um, what their value might be, as as well as their cross cutting potential, and and then um, revisit maybe with the group in terms of whether or not that would be valuable to put out there. Um, it, this may be, I'm fine with this being the first step of maybe multiple steps uh, of a working group if this wants to continue to help flesh this out further before we even go forward. But um, overall, I don't think it was a, a waste of time. Uh, everyone seemed enthusiastic to participate, and I think uh, most of us got something out of this. So at bare minimum, uh, I think that it, it was a win. <laughs> I oh definitely it's not a waste of time. Don't ever think that. You know, I think, I think the ideas of a you know we can explore it you know by email over time with the people who are here. Um, you know, it, it may not be like a special issue with multiple articles. It could be. You know, it might just be a unif a paper on you know some of the things you're talking about. You know that we all co-author together and kind of chart the course for, you know, what's needed and uh, in, in research and management and, and, uh, and then definitely an oak working group or something, you know, would be fabulous where we can uh, continue on with your initial efforts here. You know, I should back up and then I'll say that a lot of the motivation has come from our emphasis as a fire consortium from the Joint Fire Science Program, and we're primarily focused on oak ecosystem issues. And you know, through that effort, we know that we have people from California, from the Southwest, from the Rocky Mountain region, even from Europe, uh, accessing our information. So we know that it has value across a large region, um, but we really haven't explored too far out of our region, uh, how we might build upon that or expand that or, or improve some of that for, for a larger oak ecosystem audience. And this was somewhat motivated by that, kind of uh, poking at that, see, see where it could go. And, um, but as well as, you know, looking into 
uh, research gaps uh, for actual, uh, you know, scientific endeavors as well. We wear that hat too. And um, so um, in, in, much, in much of an uh, exploratory spirit, both in uh, information transfer and in research potential, I think that uh, we gained a lot from this. And, um, and I will plan to continue to develop it after this in terms of on paper and share it back with the group to, to maybe see where it's going. And um, maybe we can have a, a group, group meeting um, in a couple of months uh, to see where, where we might um, take it further or not. I think it's great. And I, you know, I, number one, to bring East and West together, you know, is I think great. And, and, and also, but it's making me think there's like a group of people out there where Oaks are like the problem, you know, Gamble Oak is a competitor with what they want. And, and Oaks are a problem with Oak Savannas or Prairies. And, you know, maybe we don't draw those people into a meeting like this because they hate Oaks. They don't want to go to a Oak loving group. Um, so I just, I just, uh, I think all of these things are positive benefits of, of an Oak working group, you know? Yeah. And I know Dan, you're involved with IUFRO international Oak group. So, um, Certainly there are efforts at even larger scales where people are interested in. Yeah. Technology. And Mexico has the greatest number of oaks in the world. Right. You know? Any other last comments by folks? Eric, Matt, Catherine, Rick, Joe. No, it was, it was great. Um, it wasn't a waste of time. Although I said, when I come back, I just had to jump out and learn about sequoias. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think uh, we have a lot to learn out West from all the work you've done in the East. And, and I think there's just an opportunity for cross fertilization. And so, We can convert those sequoia forest to oak forest now. It's happening. Yeah, what, what, one thing to add on to what Rosemary said about the, the drought um, sensitivity. When I mean, you look at the data from the Sierra Nevada, where we lost something like uh, you know 40 to 50 percent of the ponderosa pine and white fir, is that a lot of the papers are showing the mortality in the black oak was almost nil during the drought, and so it, it, it is quite interesting. And it's not maybe not just uh, where you say like the water use efficiency or, or uh, where they're drawing their water from, but isn't it also just that the oaks, they, they, can, they can just drop some of their leaves in, in, a, in, a, in a dry time. They have an ability to, to adjust to uh, moisture differences better than conifers. Yeah. But anyway, I look forward to continuing the discussion and, and uh, Okay, well, thank you all for contributing. I think I'll, I'll close this up now. Um, and um, we will be in touch. We'll keep this going. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Sounds good. See you, Thanks, Bryce. Yeah. yeah, good to see you. Maybe we can do it in person. Yeah. <laughs> see y'all. See you later.